It's good to be back with everyone on this Saturday. Over the last several weeks, there's been many controversial things going on in our country. There have been uh, still the things going on with the pandemic. And as we continue in the book of Acts, I want us to see that the leadership in our congregations really matter. I have experienced that just today and yesterday. Got a call that our water line had broke at the building at our church. It's about 500 yards worth of uh, water line. And so we've known this for a long time would eventually happen. And so we, we called the plumbers and all those appropriate people and the whole time through, uh, the two deacons at Bel Air were there the whole time, uh, helped clearing out weeds, uh, just just waiting there with the plumbers to, to figure out what to do. And I gotta tell you, I've appreciated it a lot. During the time of uh, our lockdowns and, you know, we, we have many uh, older people in our congregation, the deacons and their wives took care of the uh, the widows of the church. They checked on one another. They checked on uh, the many in our congregation. And so I can't say enough about the deacons as well as we have a lay pastor at our church who has, has just filled in every time he's needed to. And I'm so thankful for those leaders in our congregation. A common phrase that many churchgoers say is, my pastor never, and you can fill in the blank. Maybe you have told someone or said to yourself what your pastor doesn't do that you wish or think he should do. I've also heard many say those deacons at my church act like they own the place. The truth is, most, most of the time, pastors may not be in a congregation very long. I'm one of those exceptions. I've been there 22 years. But oftentimes, the deacons have been there a long time. And they've, they've been there, and they've had to make some tough decisions and be part of some tough decisions. And so a lot of people, they see them in a negative way. Light. They see the leaders of the congregation in a negative way. As we con continue in our, our study in Acts, I want us to be reminded that it's God that designed the way that the congregation should be set up. It is God that, that has designed that. It is also the fact that Christ is the head of the church. No one owns the church. The church is God's. And I'll go another step further and even say the congregation, each and every one of them, belongs to God. Not to the pastor, not to the deacons, not to anyone. It belongs to God. See, God is the one that has called the pastors. God is the one that has placed the calling on those deacons. God is the one that has, has given each believer in him the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit so that the church would be edified through those gifts. God does the things he does in the church for his purpose. And we need to be reminded of that. Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. 
They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. The first question I want to ask is what was the purpose of choosing these, these seven deacons? Most scholars agree that these were the first deacons. These were the first ones to be chosen. See, there was a need for unity. The widows within their congregation were fighting. They were arguing because they felt like some were treat, being treated better than others. They felt like those widows who were Hebrew, they were being, being given more favor. They were getting food distributed to them while the other widows were not being taken care of. It's interesting how there's always accusations of discrimination or racism or those things within a congregation. And many times it has nothing to do with that. It just simply has to do with there's, there's so much to be done that just a few leaders cannot take care of everything. It's just too much. And so we see that they needed unity as a, as a congregation, as a church. Whether we like it or not, the bottom line is the widows felt like no one cared about. It's easy to get angry at people as a pastor. I will tell you, it's easy to get angry when people say things like, pastor doesn't take care of us or the deacons don't care because I know that's not true but I also understand that sometimes people need attention they need that love they need it to be reminded how much they matter and so there may be many of you out there or maybe a few that feel like no one cares maybe at your congregation you're thinking, the leaders don't care about me. I'll tell you that at Bel Air, I love every single person that comes to Bel Air. Not because I'm just saying that, but because I truly care about them. Many of those in our congregation I've known for a long time, but some I've known less than a year. And I quickly begin to see how God uses them but I also begin to see that sometimes they, they feel like no one cares. And I understand that. And so we see a need for these deacons. We see that in this passage, the deacons are to be mediators, not agitators. This is so important. See, we need a need, there's a need for physical ministry. The reason that most believe that these seven men were the first deacons is because of their job description. See, it says, the apostle said, we're not going to be table waiters. That's what a deacon is. They're a servant. They're a table waiter. They take care of physical needs of the people. Oftentimes in our congregations, and I think this is, is due to uh, churches way back in the, in the country days, as we would say, where maybe a pastor had four or five churches. And so he would pastor, he would preach at one congregation and take care of that congregation for a week. And then he would take off and he would be back at that congregation for maybe a month or longer. And so the deacons had to step up and take care of some of those pastoral duties. But through the years, you begin to see that in a lot of congregations, the deacons think they're the ones that, that make all the decisions. 
I'm so fortunate that at Bel Air that that's not the case. But I've seen it so many times that deacons, they want to tell the pastor what to do. They want to tell him when he can go on vacation. They want to, to, to do that portion of the work instead of doing the physical work. See, they were the mediators. They're the ones to solve that issue with the widows. Now they could have stirred it up and made it worse. They could have said, hey, I don't know why you picked me because uh, Peter or John, one of those apostles needs to do this. This ain't my job. But see, they chose these seven men. That shows how important it is. As a pastor, when I knew I was called, I shared that calling that I was called to be a pastor. But the deacons, they're chosen. They were chosen by the people. And so we see that they're to be mediators. Deacons are also to be servants, not served. Oftentimes, the deacons put themselves in a place of, of power. But see, they're servants. That doesn't mean that the pastor is the, the almighty powerful person in that building. But what it does mean is that the deacons should be about serving, not being served. When I hear about leaders in churches and they're saying things like, the pastor's not feeding me well enough, the pastor's not doing this for me, the pastor's not doing that for me, the first thing I wanna to say to them is you have forgotten your calling. You have forgotten your role as a deacon. You are to serve, you are to serve tables. It doesn't sound like a fun job and many times it's not. You know, when the pipes break and there's a large expense, you don't wanna be the guy out there with the shovel and trying to help figure things out. But that's what they did. See, they're servants. They know what matters. They're the ones that, when the pastor can't go to the hospital and see people, they go. They're the ones that them and their wives, they call and they check on people. And then they let me know as the pastor when there are times that, that I need to intervene and be a part. They do so many things that I don't even know what they do until people in my congregation say, brother so-and-so came and mowed my yard, Bro and brother so-and-so fixed my air conditioner, brother so-and-so did this. See, they never do it for attention. They never do it till they can feel good about themselves or brag. They quietly serve and they take care of God's people. Deacons are to be respected and not feared. This is really important. Through my 22 years as pastor, I have seen deacons that have been feared. They've been feared by the pastoral staff. They've been feared by other deacons. They've been feared by people within the congregation. And you say, well, why do they fear them? Because some of those deacons have stepped into the place that really they think they're God. And they want to tell the people what to do and they will, they will make it bad for you if you don't do what they say. They're kind of bullies in a congregation. And many times they're friends with the right people. They they know the right things to say at the right time. But the truth is, is people don't respect them, they fear them. But there are also deacons, as the two I've spoken of, that they're highly respected. When they say something, people listen because they know that these men are full of wisdom. When, when these men come to me, and say, Pastor, we need to look into this situation or we need to do this. I listen because I have great respect for them. There are many deacons in our congregations that without them, 
the church would not survive. You need th that physical attention with the people. And when they do their job, when they fulfill what God has called them to, people have great respect for them. I thank God that I can, I can say honestly that Bel Air has deacons that I have great respect for. Now I want to see the second thing from this task is, from this, this text is what was the task of the pastors? Now, yes, I know it's talking about the apostles, but in this context, the apostles were pastoring the early churches. They were, they were pastoring these churches. Yes, they were apostles, but they were also pastors. We can see that men like Paul, he would start in many churches. He would pastor that church for a, a short time, and then when he left, someone else would come and, and fill that role. So what is the task of pastors? See, there was need for spiritual leadership. That's what the apostles were talking about. They said, we understand that the physical needs need to be taken care of. It matters. But we can't take care of all the physical needs and the spiritual needs of the people at the same time. And if we try, we're going to do uh, a poor job at both. And so the pastors, the apostles, wanted to spend their time in prayer, in study, in preaching. See, they needed to focus on those things because the spiritual teaching and the importance of the spiritual aspect of a church is vital. Without it, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a club. So what are pastors to do? Pastors are to focus on the spiritual matters, not the physical. When I first became a pastor, my first several years were tough. They were really tough. I remember speaking to many deacons that were in that congregation and I brought up this passage. I said, I, I need you guys to take care of the physical aspects, to take care of the families within the congregation so that I can focus on prayer and study and preaching and teaching the word. I had a few deacons, they've been deacons for a long time and not just that congregation, but many other congregations through the years. And they said to me, while that is correct in the Bible, that's not how we do things around here. We pay you money to take care of people in the hospitals. We pay you money to go take care of the physical needs of the people. We pay you money to go fix things when it needs to be fixed. And I said, but that's not what God's called me to. And I have to tell you that that first several years was, was so difficult. I was a very young man, and it was so difficult because I knew what the scripture said, but I didn't have very many deacons that were fulfilling their roles because as they told me, we'll tell you when you can go on vacation. We'll tell you how long you can take a vacation. We'll tell you even the places that you cannot go on vacation. We'll tell you what your schedule is. We'll tell you when you're in the building and not in the building. And it went on and on and on. Pastors, we got to focus on the spiritual matters. And yes, sometimes when the pipes break and you're the pastor, so you get the phone call, you're going to have to be involved just as I was. But when I showed up to help make a, a decision, the two deacons were already there. See, there are times that pastors have to jump in and help in those situations. But we need to be able to focus on the spiritual aspect. 
I think one of the greatest downfalls of all ministers, all pastors, is our lack of prayer time. I'm not proud to say this, but my prayer life sometimes is dictated by my, my secular job. It's dictated by my time to study and my time to prepare for, for Sundays. And you say, well, you don't pray about your sermon. Of course I do. But oftentimes my prayer time gets cut short by the many other things that I do. That's not an excuse. It doesn't make it okay, but it's the truth. See, many pastors, people assume that we, we pray, 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 pray all the time, and we should, but it's not necessarily the case. And the more of those physical duties that the deacons and, and leaders within the congregation can, can take care of, the more time the pastor will be able to do what God has called him to do from a spiritual aspect. Pastors are also to turn over responsibility to those chosen, not micromanage. I can picture one of the deacons who has been at Bel Air way before I got there. I've been there 22 years. And he would tell you that when I started as a 29 year 29 year old young man as pastor, having never pastored before. I had worked with youth and worship, but I had never pastored a church before. I will tell you that he, he will laugh tomorrow when he hears this. See, I had a hard, hard, hard time allowing anybody else to do anything. And then when I gave them a task, I micromanaged them. I followed them around and tried to make sure they were doing it. You know, the last 10 years, well, I've been bivocational. I have learned that I can't be in all those, those places at one time. And yes, it, at my congregation, I do a lot of things still. I play the piano and I teach a Sunday school class and I help with worship and some of those secretarial duties and those things. But there are many other people in that small congregation that do a lot of things. I'm still learning how to hand things to other people to trust them. Because the truth is, they're not going to do it like me. That doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means that they're going to do it differently. And if God has called them to, to take care of that task, that ministry, whatever it may be, then I have to trust that God will give them the ability and what they need to do. And he will take care of that. God doesn't need my help. If God meant for me to do everything, he would give me all the tasks. And I couldn't do them. It's not possible. I think many pastors struggle with this because it's sometimes easier to do it yourself than to ask someone. Sometimes... You have to ask 10 or 15 people to get things accomplished. And it's frustrating. But we need to not be so quick to jump in and just do it ourselves. I have two pastors that mentored me greatly through the many years. And both of them told me something that, that makes a lot of sense. They said, the way you know that a pastor was successful in a congregation is how that congregation does once that person leaves. Now, both these pastors have died. They've been with the Lord for a long time. But I've often thought about, what if I was not able to pastor the church anymore? What would happen to Bel Air? And I have to be honest with you, at times, that is a, a terrifying thought because I do a lot there. My wife and my parents, we do a lot at the church. See, it's it's not about me. What, what can the church do without me? And so in moments when things go wrong and plumbing goes bad and, and we have people in the congregation who are having illnesses and things, 
they were still taken care of without me. That's a true blessing. Pastors are to turn over responsibility to those chosen, not micromanage. I know I've said that. But I want to repeat it because it's God's congregation. It's God's church. Pastors are to remember that God gives the increase, not pastors. You know, I've found out that some people have listened to these sermons that I didn't know about until I've seen comment here or there. Sometimes they disagree with me. Sometimes they don't like what I said. And to be honest, there's not been a lot of people uh, that have watched the sermons, but that's not what I do it for. When I began doing online sermons, it's something I said I'd never do. But the, the COVID-19 put us in a situation where we didn't really have a choice. And then God has led me to continue doing this, and I will continue to, to do this online message each week until God tells me not to. Some would say, well, only five or six people listen. And trust me, I've thought about that with my very busy schedule. I've thought about it. But the truth is, I've been called to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. I've been called to lift up Christ so that more people be drawn to him. I've been called to preach the word in season and out of season. God never said anything about me growing the church. And trust me, I've tried to think of thousands of ways to grow the church. And as I have been pastor for quite some time now, I have learned day by day that I can never grow that church numerically. That's, that's not what God called me to do. God called me to preach and to be faithful to teach and preach his word. He'll take care of the numbers. He'll take care of the growth. You know, sometimes it's not about adding numerically to the congregation. Sometimes it's about the, the congregation being matured so that they too can be witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's weeks that I look at the attendance numbers and I go, what am I doing wrong? Even after 22 years, I still have those moments. I have those moments that I preach and it looks like at the end of the, the service during the altar call that no one listened. And then I'm reminded of this point. God did not call me to increase the numbers of the people in that congregation. God called me to be faithful to preach his word and he'll take care of the rest. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can just study your word. Lord, I thank you for those who have been called to be pastors, those who have been chosen to be deacons, Lord. Lord, I pray that each of us would fulfill our calling and fulfill our roles. And Lord, I just pray that, that we would be reminded that what we do matters. Even when people say things about us or are terrible to us, that Lord, it's about you and it's about the strengthening and edification of your church, Lord. And Lord, I pray that we are reminded that it's your church, that Jesus is the head, he is the head of this body. Lord, I pray that we're faithful to preach, to teach your word, and to lift you up in all things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.